Uh, I think this is a very good question and it's very much timely because of all the discussions that are happening in, uh, recently within the new proposal of the Commission that was published last year in April 2023, where it was introduced this concept or terminology around unmet medical needs and high unmet medical needs. So the reasoning behind commission of bringing this terminology was to drive research and incentivize research in areas there was a need or there was no treatments. So, I mean, for rare diseases, we know there's 95% of rare disease who doesn't have treatment. And for the ones that they do, this 5%, 70% is just symptomatic. So there's still a need to develop more therapies in this uh, group where there's nothing. However, having those terminology, these two layers of unmet need and high unmet medical need gives a connotation or a hierarchy of that some group of conditions could be more important or more need than others. So once uh, now the, the, the commission has proposed two definitions, which for orphans will imply both. So all orphan, all orphan medicinal products will be unmet medical need and, high unmet, and some of those will be high unmet medical need. However, where we see the difference is that when it would be unmet medical need, now the definition is that will be disease or conditions which are life-threatening or debilitating. And then that if there's no treatment, of course, we fall under scope, but if there is a treatment, then the new treatment that it comes should be reducing mortality or morbidity in the, in, in the condition. And then the, the difference with high and medical need will be that it will be also, also a life-threatening disease, single debilitating, but that the new product should bring exceptional therapeutic advantage, meaning that should be much better than what is out there. So the problem that we see besides this terminology of grouping diseases between high and medical need and unmet medical need, because for patient groups, this, this has not been, been very well received. Um, we also see that how the difficult of the implementation will be, how regulators will be deciding which is an unmet medical need, high unmet medical need, and how the data could uh, support these decisions. Yes, so actually, and um, within the com since the Commission published the, the pharmaceutical legislation, we've been working a lot with the members of the Parliament and parliamentarians in order to try to delete this concept or this terminology around a medical need, a high medical need. But unfortunately, we didn't succeed because it was clear that they wanted to, to maintain this terminology. However, what we really succeed on is that at least the EMA is the one who will be drafting these guidelines defining what is an medical need, high and medical need, also having which criteria should be followed. So what we have uh, incorporated now in the text of the parliament is that at least patient representatives and their families should be the ones defining what is an element need for them. So that's uh, for us was a, a red line. We wanted to have it. We now have it, but this is not over because it's still the council. Um, we're still doing advocacy to keep it. However, for us, what we have suggested instead of this terminology also was to have an early and multi-stakeholder dialogue because for patients, clinicians, regulators, they know what is an unmet medical need for them and how to address this topic or how to address it better in the new, in the new treatments. So we really encourage the EMA, besides in, including all the stakeholders in these definitions, to have this conversation uh, with all the stakeholders to better address their needs. Yes, so from my session, I think it was very good because we had representatives from FPA, the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Companies. We also had a, a nematologist, a clinician, a regulator and payer, and me and myself as a patient representative. And I think we were all in agreement that we cannot define unmet medical needs by ourselves, that this is a very um, difficult topic that really needs this multi-stakeholder discussion and everyone bringing their own perspectives in what is important, but most importantly, patients bringing their own perspectives on how to address that. Also, what I wanted also to highlight is, as I mentioned, this is still an ongoing file in, in the Commission or in, in Europe. So we are still advocating to, to have it 
to have this type of involvement of patients when drafting the guidelines, to have it in the council recommendations as well, because there's still one year of advocacy. We don't know when will be finalized and implemented, but we need a legislation that it's feasible, that gives EMA kind of flexibility to interpret for interpretation, but also that the legislation fits for the purpose that should have and it needs to last now it lasted 20 years, so we expect that, you know, the, the legislation should be flexible enough to uh, to address what the, the needs of the patients, but also the science that is coming, which advances really fast. And regulation usually stops it, <laughs> kind of. And to conclude, maybe I would like just to, to encourage all the stakeholders, clinicians, patients, regulators, to keep the advocacy during this last year of of these negotiations, to keep what is what it matters for us in in the legislation and also to remind politicians and a bit of call to action to the new parliament to tell health policy in their mandate, in their new mandate. And of course, the European plan for, for rare disease that we are advocating from Eurorodis. And also I would like to thank, of course, EHA for the opportunity to discuss this topic here, which was very important.